Good morning. It's good to be back with you guys again. And for those of you who uh, who haven't been here before when I've preached here, um, my name is Stephen Roy. Uh, I'm just honored to be here this morning, and I haven't seen most of you since last year. It's a new year. So. <laughs> um, this morning, though, I'm going to be talking about uh, about holiness. And especially as we're looking forward to a new year, and uh, what is what is God's desire for us? A lot of us have made resolutions, and a lot of us have a lot of things we'd like to see happen during the new year. But what does God desire for us? So I'm just going to pray real quick before I get started, and then I'll get into this. So, Lord God Almighty, we are so honored, Father, to be in Your presence this morning, God. And we just, Father, we desire this morning, Lord, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds to your word, to your truth, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Father, as I speak, that nothing would come out of my mouth that shouldn't, Father. Nothing that's uh, out of line with your word, God. But, Lord, that I would be 100% under your influence, under your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. And that you would just use this, Father, for the furtherance of your kingdom, for your honor, and for your glory, Lord Jesus. I just thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for being with us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this morning, uh, the main text I'm going to use is uh, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. And it's a parable, one of Jesus' parables. And it says, And Jesus answered and spoke to them by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding that they were not and they were not able or willing to come again he sent out other servants saying tell those who are invited see i have prepared my dinner my oxen and my, and my fatted cattle are killed all things are ready come to the wedding but they made light of it they went their way one to his own farm another to his business and the rest seized his servants treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, burned up their city. Then he sent, said to the servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And this is a parable about a wedding feast. It's a joyful occasion. It's something to be celebrated. And the king, who is representing God in this parable, wanted certain people to, to celebrate with him and his son. Those people represent the Pharisees and all the other Israelites who, who rejected Jesus as God's son. After the rejection of the Pharisees, God tells his servants to go into the highways and to invite as many people as they can find at the wedding. On the wedding day, the guests arrive. And it's interesting that uh, as, as God is going through the wedding guests, um, how, how he put this one story in about a man who didn't have on a wedding garment. And just because he, was wearing a, he wasn't wearing a wedding garment, he was dismissed from the wedding. And he wasn't just let out, he was bound hand and foot and cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth just because he wasn't wearing the right clothing to a wedding feast. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that even though this man had accepted the invitation, he was in the right place for the wedding, he wasn't allowed to stay and enjoy the wedding feast? I don't believe it was just the outward appearance of the man because he wore a Carhartt or something like that and sat in the front row. I believe it was the condition of his heart where he was not willing to reverence God as holy. Jude 1, 20-23 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others say with fear, 
pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. I believe this man had a defiled garment. I believe that he wanted to follow Christ because he showed up. He showed interest in being there, but he did not fear him and did not reverence him as Lord. I believe that this man would go so far as to go to church and would even be convicted at some of the sermons. I bet he thought he was a pretty good person, but he was not willing to change fully into the image of Jesus Christ. He did not recognize how holy God is, how awesome God is, and the occasion he was being invited to. He was simply looking at Christ as a ticket to get to heaven. He saw the wedding feast and said, I want to be a part of that. He says, I can live my life how I want with its pleasures, and God will love me enough to let me not go to hell. He knew his heart, in his heart, that God was real, but he only wanted God on his terms. He was a grace-only person. And I believe all of Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, where it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I also believe that there is an outworking to our faith that results in a holy life. The evidence that you are following Christ is works coming from your faith, holy works. Now I want to read through James 2, 14 through 26 real quick, just to show that point real quick. Starting on the 14th verse. What is a prophet, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. There will be a visible evidence for your faith in Christ. I watched a video last week uh, where Rabbi Zacharias, he presented an argument for biblical marriage between one man and one woman. He was doing an open forum at a university, and uh, one person presented a question and asked, why is it that Christians stand against homosexuality? Rabbi, he gave a great answer to the question, and uh, straight from the Bible, but after the video, I looked down in the comments of the video. I've never seen more comments on a video than I did on this. On some of the threads, there were over 500 replies. And I saw there was a lot of people there who were trying to twist the scripture uh, to prove the point that it's a, uh, homosexuality is okay and it's not a sin. And I don't know about you, but when I look at that stuff, it just it rips me apart on the inside. I can't. I don't know. I have a hard. I can't even read the comments on a lot of videos just because it tears me apart. It makes me wonder how people can accept all the grace and mercy of God and reject the part about God calling us to live a holy life. They only want a part of God. And I believe it starts with us forgetting or not believing that God who is who he says he is. And God is holy. We've got a story it's, uh, about a, a criminal who was in England. Uh, it says, Charlie Peace was a criminal. Laws of God or, or man encouraged him not. Finally the law caught up with him and he was condemned to death. On the fatal morning in Armley Jail, Leeds, England, he was taken on the death walk. Before him went the prison chaplain, routinely and sleepily reading some Bible verses. The criminal touched the preacher and asked what he was reading. The, consol of the, the consolation of religion was the reply. 
Charlie Peace was shocked at the way he professionally read about hell. Could a man be so unmoved under the very shadow of the scaffold as to lead a fellow human there, and yet dried-eyed read of a pit that has no bottom into which this fellow must fall? Could this preacher believe the word that there is an eternal fire that never consumes its victims, and yet slide over the phrase without a tremor? Is a man human at all who says with no tears, you will be eternally dying, yet never know the relief that death brings? All this was too much for Charlie Peace, so he preached. Listen to this on the eve of hell sermon. He said, sir, addressing the preacher, if I believe what you and the Church of God say that you believe, even if England were covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk over it if need be on hands and knees and think it worthwhile living just to save one soul from eternal hell like that. Charlie Peace had a revelation of the righteous justice and the judgment of God. He recognized in that moment the holiness that he lacked and the seriousness of his crime against a holy God. I believe the church needs a revelation of who God is. I believe they need to see his holiness again. They need to see how awesome he is. John Wesley preached many times on the righteousness of God and the holiness of God. On one such occasion it was reliably reported that over 1,200 people were lying face down on the ground because they had heard and they had seen how holy God is. That's all it took for Isaiah was seeing God in his holiness as well. Even the seraphim wouldn't look at God. They had six wings and with two of them they covered their face. And it was all that they could cry was holy, holy, holy. It is the natural response of someone who knows God or has been or is in God's presence. I want to read one more passage real quick out of Numbers 20, verses 1 through 13. It says, Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought us up to the assembly of the Lord into his wilderness, into this wilderness, that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and all their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the, the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and said, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the assembly into the land which I have given them. It's amazing to me how Moses had walked with God. He had such an intimate relationship with God. In Exodus 33, 11, it even says that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Moses asked God to show him his glory, and God put Moses between two rocks and passed by him. God showed him his back because he said, You, you shall not see my face, for no man shall see me and live. But that one act, first in verse 10, where Moses said, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? We, and then Moses struck the rock two times with his rod. God had told him to speak to the rock, but Moses knew better in his own mind. And because of that one act, he was not allowed to take the children of Israel into the promised land, neither was he allowed to enter. God is holy. He is so holy that at one point, 
even regretted making man and destroyed every single person on the earth with a flood aside from eight people. I've heard estimates of how many people were on the earth before the flood. Some estimate that there were over a billion. And whether it was a billion or whether it was a million, he only saved eight people. That brings new light to the scripture in Luke where it says, uh, Luke 17, 26 through 27, where Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were all given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus is so holy that the Apostle John, who walked with Jesus, laid his head on his chest and talked with Jesus. He fell at his feet as dead when he saw the glorified Christ. The Holy Spirit is so holy that Ananias and Sapphira, when they lied to Peter, he said they lied to the Holy Spirit and they died instantly, one at a time. God will not put up with you or I wearing the garment of the flesh and trying to know him. First Peter, uh, I didn't put the chapter number in there, but it's verses 13 through 15 in one of those chapters. It says, uh, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to your former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. God said that five times in the Old Testament, and it's reiterated here. And it's not, it's not just my personal opinion or one man's theology. Our God is calling us to live in holiness. Revelation 3, 4 through 5, and this is the church in Sardis, the dead church. It says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Got another story real quick. It's, um, it's, you, it's called You Bought Me to Set Me Free. Years ago, an Englishman had made his fortune in the gold fields in California. He was returning to England to live. He forwarded his wealth to London and came overland by stage and river steamer to New Orleans. From there, he planned to take a ship to New York and from there to England. As a tourist in New Orleans, he did as most tourists did in that day. He went down to the slave market. In the early 1850s, slaves were still being sold in New Orleans and elsewhere in the South. It was a noisy and an active market. Men were gathered there observing a young, very beautiful black woman who was up for bid. He heard the men's comments as they were speaking about her. He saw two evil-looking men bidding for her quite heatedly. And then they overheard, he overheard them say what they would do with her and his whole heart revolted against the whole swinish business. Finally, as the bids rose higher and higher and more frenzied, he beckoned to the auctioneer, quoted a figure that was exactly twice the last bid, utterly beyond anything that had ever been paid for a slave in New Orleans before. The auctioneer said, have you any money? He said, yes, I have the money. So the bill of sale was made out. The Englishman went over to the block to claim the woman whom he had purchased. As she came down one step and stood about level with his eyes, she spat full in his face and hissed, I hate you. He said nothing. With the back of his hand, he wiped the spittle away. Then he took her by the hand. He walked down one street through the mud, down another street. Finally, they came to a little office building. She couldn't read. She didn't know what it was. The Englishman went to the desk and began to speak. The man behind the desk began to protest again. Ignoring the agent's protest, the Englishman said, I insist, I insist, it's the law, I insist. Finally, after the business transaction was completed, the Englishman received a paper with an official seal. He then walked over to the black woman who was like a beast ready to spring on him. He extended the paper to her. Here are your manumission papers. You are free. Still, she hissed, I hate you. Don't you understand, he said. These are your manumission papers. You are free. 
She said, no, I don't understand. You paid twice as much for me as any buyer in the New Orleans market. Now you're giving me my freedom. I don't believe you. He said, yes, these are your manumission papers, signed and officially sealed, and he put them in her hand. She said to him, do you mean to say that you bought me to set me free? He said, yes, that is why I bought you, to set you free. Tears came up into her eyes, her face softened. She slipped down to her knees, reached down, put her hands on his rough miner's boots, laid her cheek down on the toe of one of them. And through her tears, she sobbed, you bought me to set me free. You bought me to set me free. You paid more than anyone has ever paid for a slave. You bought me to set me free. Then she choked through her tears. She said, sir, all I want in life is to be your slave. You bought me to set me free. And God has bought his children to set them free. Free from death, hell, and the grave. But he also has, has bought us to set us free from the sin that so easily ensnares us. He desires that as we serve Christ, we become more and more like him. He bought each one of us to set us free. And I've, I've been here, this is my third time preaching here, but I'd like to share my testimony with you guys as well. Um, and kind of let you know my background a little bit. I'm number two out of ten kids, and uh, I have one older sister. She just she came home for the holiday. She's over in China. But um, uh, I remember when I was in vacation Bible school as a child, I heard about hell, and I decided I didn't want to go there. And so that night I, I went home and I prayed asked ask for Jesus to come into my heart. And uh, from that point, I had a knowledge about God, and I knew a lot of things about God, but I didn't really know him the way that he wanted me to know him. I wasn't trusting him as my savior. And I got into a lot of things that I shouldn't have got into. I started looking at pornography on the internet and, uh, and when I was about 14 years old. And the guilt and the shame from that ate at me for a long time. And um, I never wanted to tell anybody. I wanted to escape. And I decided when I was 18, I was going to go join the Marine Corps and just run away from it all. And um, my dad, or he asked that I would go get some ministry experience. First, I went to work at a Christian camp one summer. And um, I decided to, to try it out. And then that fall, I was going to join. And um, through that summer working there, though, God completely changed my life. And he completely turned, completely turned me around 180 degrees and set me in a new direction. And it really, this story really illustrates what happened in my life. And I, I realized for the first time, he bought me to set me free because he loved me so much. And now I'm on the other side of it, and I'm saying, God, all I want to do in life is be your slave. All I want to do is exalt you. I want you to be the number one in my life, no matter what. I want to walk in your holiness, not just because you have a law and because I want to follow your law, but because I want to honor you and I want to do what you want to do, you want me to do. I also want to confess something else to you. I don't like preaching. <laughs> I really don't, but I know that it's something that he wants me to do. And I have a youth, I'm the youth pastor at Fraser Road, and I, I don't even like talking to them when there's a big girl. I like talking one on one, but when they're a group, they're kind of intimidating. But I know that it's something that he wants me to do, and he wants me to, to put him first in every area of my life. There are people that we all see when we, and we say, uh, that we say to ourselves about, there's no doubt in my mind that they are a true Christian. They have a genuine love for God. They have a reverence for Christ above everything else in their life. They're crucified to the world. They carry a burden for the church and the lost, and they are acting in the love of God towards those around them. They have a living faith. And those people are not even the standard of holiness. Christ is. He is the only standard of holiness. And I ask you guys today, what is it going to take for you to go all out for Jesus. To say, what is it going to take 
for you to let go of the world in any area. And I'm not just talking about the big ones either. Is there something that's holding you back from doing the will of Christ or, or being as effective as you can for His kingdom? Do you truly desire Him more than anything in your life? Do you desire to live a holy life out of love for Him? Let's pray together.